So micro contact, where we are, what we found and where we are going. Let me uh, just share the screen with you for a second. Here we go. And so I'll tell you uh, about our work on Italo Romance varieties in the Americas. Um, heritage Italo Romance varieties in the Americas. I will tell you a little bit about Microcontact, which is the project uh, I've been working on with the whole team for more than three years now. So I'll tell you what we found in, in terms of the speakers, etc., but also in terms of generalizations uh, on the data. And I'll give you a little bit of our sketch of an analysis. Um, I would like to start from the conclusions of this talk. And the conclusions will be that in fact, what we noticed is that there are at least two strategies at work in changing contact. Um, and in the resolution of conflicts based on our knowledge and our study of heritage languages. One strategy, which is the one which is commonly invoked uh, in heritage studies, um, which involves, let's say, grammar in the sense that it involves uh, whatever um, concerns the faculty of language. In any event, the, the, the contact between two different languages, the typological similarities among, among the languages in particular, and uh, some, some factors that have to do with with the languages, so language specific factors. But then there is another strategy which um, has been a bit overlooked, which is um, a strategy that speakers cannot, um, uh, sorry, resort to when they can't find, when they can't pinpoint the, the variation, the locus of variation. Um, and that is a, a more cognitive structure. So when, when speakers are unable to uh, perceive the difference between two grammars or more grammars, either because these grammars are extremely similar, like two dialects of the same language, two var var varieties of the same language continuum, etc., or because there are many languages and they are extremely varied and, and different, when the speakers cannot perceive this different, uh, they resolve conflict between grammars uh, through the use of some general cognitive strategies. Um, so if speakers are able to perceive the point of variation, like in what we call macro contact, meaning two grammars more or less that are quite separate from each other, distant, typologically distant, and for which the speaker has a clear typological um, perception of the, the fact that they are not uh, close to each other typologically. Uh, in this case, uh, they will go with all the strategies that we've heard and we know about um, for heritage from heritage language studies. But if speakers are not able to perceive the point of variation, because for instance, the variation is minimal, it has to do with a little uh, micro variation on one single feature, or because the variation is vast and enormous, like in the case of Creoles, then they resort to general cognitive principles probably. And in fact, the strategies that we could identify are mainly, or the strategy that we think we could, could identify is mainly linking. Linking, um, so change is driven by linking of the various parts of, of grammar, either to what's been expressed before or to uh, the reality around the speaker. Now, uh, regarding heritage languages, we, we know a lot of, of generalizations and these have been proven, uh, despite the fact that I mentioned, for instance, Polinsky, these have been largely uh, supported by all sorts of, of evidence. We know that heritage, heritage speakers uh, tend to avoid indeterminacy in the sense that if, they, if there is a um, function word, for instance, that has more than one use, they select one. As an example, consider Romance A, in most, most Romance, not all Romance languages, but many Romance languages have A, um, which is used as a preposition, as a locative uh, marker. It is used as a dative marker. It is used in those languages that have it as a differential object marker. It has many uses. Well, speakers of heritage languages select one of these uses and overextend it normally. 
The interface hypothesis is, uh, doesn't need um, any explanation for the people in this group either. When there's more, to make it simple, when there's more than one grammatical module involved, let's talk about grammar, within grammar now. So including discourse and processing, this is all about language, let's say. When there's more than one language involved, uh, sorry, more than one module, grammatical module involved in, the, in uh, processing of a phenomenon, uh, this phenomenon will be um, easily targeted for language change. One example is we will see in uh, null subjects, null subjects for, for in order for, for a speaker to master null subject, the distribution of null subject, they have to know not only the occurrence of null subject, not only the fact that there is a pro or whatever you want, where you, but also when you can omit the subject, in which discourse conditions is it licit to omit the subject. So you need to have knowledge or at least intuitive, we're always talking about intuitive knowledge, um, in conscious, let's say, not conscious knowledge, of course. It is not that speakers uh, start making syntactic trees to do these things, but I mean, this is unconscious, no, sorry, unconscious no knowledge of these, um, of these, all of these elements. And then uh, another principle according to which uh, speakers uh, work when they are they have to resolve some uh, language conflict and language contact is avoid silent elements and it, this is a bit of a consequence for what we said before when you you have to deal with a gap an ellipsis or a, a pro no subject you are um, in trouble because you have to be able to reconstruct the um the referent you have to track uh, the your, your, you have to attach your bit of silence to, to something, you need a referent, and that is not a straightforward. So um, speakers of heritage speakers usually avoid this. Now, these generalizations are based on uh, acquisition considerations, are based on performance, are based on typology. Um, an important addition, which is very important, uh, an important addition, which is very relevant for what I'm going to say, is the typological primacy model. Um, and in particular, the concept of uh, typological uh, proximity, typological perceived typological similarity. Um, the generalizations, well, we started this project by trying to look whether these generalizations hold across the board. If it is also, if they also hold for dialects, if they also hold for varieties that are extremely similar. So we decided to consider a new dimension in language change, which is called microcontact. Microcontact here means for us, contact between languages that are, that are basically typologically identical where there is minimal variation regarding a specific phenomenon that we want to consider, there is minimal variation uh, between the languages. Like for instance, one language has um, uh, targets say first uh, person pronouns and the other language targets second person pronouns, but it is still within the, the general grammar, the same phenomenon. It is not the same dif distance between like, like there is between language English and Korean. Um, microcontact, so is, it is not the social linguistic definition, meaning contact for a very short period of time or contact only among a very uh, restricted number of speakers. It is really a syntactic micro variation. So, uh, oh, I've just said that contact between languages that are typologically similar and belonging in this case, the case of this project, to the same family group. And we wanted to say, is changing, is the output of changing contact the same? And is there a way to predict what's going to happen? What strategies the speakers are going to employ? Well, um, in order to study changing contact and micro contact, uh, ideally, you well normally what you do is you look at the output and you try to reconstruct what happened because it is very hard to learn to study uh, change while it is happening ideally you would select your input very carefully in such a way that you select one feature at a time and you study what happens to that feature in contact with another language that has a, the same feature but a different expressed in a different way for instance, um, 
transitivity, let's say a little V, some languages have differential object marking, some languages don't have differential object marking, what happens to differential object marking? That is normally what happens in contact studies. You study two languages at a time. What we wanted actually was one phenomenon and one feature in contact with several different languages that all share the same feature, but the, um, for which the value of these feature is slightly different. So you have really multiple contact situations and possibly multiple, multiple um, mixed contact situations. So many languages in contact with many languages and they're all the same. They all share this phenomenon so that you can actually track what happens to the single feature in contact. This way you can also um, check whether change is caused internally, it, has, it is an endogenous kind of change, uh, or whether it is contact induced. And if it is contact induced, is it induced by the grammar of the language or by the mere fact that these languages are in contact? You can track every single feature. And, and this is you know, a, a huge exercise, but that's what we set up, we, we set ourselves up to do. So basically, if a feature X in grammar A in contact with grammar B, C, D, and A, and also look at the feature X in grammar A in isolation, so how it developed diachronically, um, if you, you follow what happens and imagine grammar B and grammar D behave exactly the same, whereas grammar C and grammar E are completely different with respect to this feature. If feature in grammar A goes in the direction of B and D, and it is exactly the same direction, and then it goes differently with C and with E, we can conclude that um, it, this change is grammar induced. Uh, then we also check what happens to the development, ideally what happens to the development of this uh, feature X in grammar A to check whether Basically, it is the same that happens. The output is the same than what, what you have in contact or not. Now, you understand that for doing this, there are very few situations in which you can. You, it is very hard to find uh, live situations in which you have all these languages in contact with all these other languages. They are all the same. They all belong to the same, let's say, macro group or macro grammar. It is not very easy. Well. We uh, identify, I identified uh, some of these languages in the Italo Romans uh, heritage languages, especially in the ones that were uh, these varieties that were spoken in um, Italy right after the war. All these are different uh, languages. They are not the same language groups. Every different color here is more or less a different language continuum, a different language, let's say more or less. We selected some phenomena to check. We selected two languages that contain this phenomenon and they are two languages from the North, despite they are different language families, um, different languages. Um, then we selected two languages from the Upper South, the two languages from the Extreme South, and then we also selected Florentine and Sienese, uh, Sienese this is Tuscan, uh, because that's the basic, the basis of Italian. All these languages, Enter in contact, entered in contact suddenly with uh, Roma, other Romance languages in America, in Argentina, in Brazil, in uh, and especially in the U.S. Though in the U.S. not with Romance languages, these these contacts were extensive. They happened at the same time. These are waves of emigration. There were a lot of emigrants moving to America. Uh, right after the war, let's say, in big groups, they all resettled, they all um, moved more or less in the same conditions, they all wanted to learn the language of the host country, they all mostly moved to stay, at least for a number of years, so that you, so that they didn't plan on going back after two months. And this um, situation helped us not only to identify all the, this uh, situation of multiple grammars in contact with other grammars that are the same and each one of them in contact with many grammars, say Veneto in Brazil, that's uh, Veneto in Argentina, there's Veneto in, in Canada, and then there's Veneto in the United States. We pick the United States because that's the, mm, the country where there's more studies about heritage Italo-Romance. The rest is completely 
uh, un understudied. So we wanted to start at least for some documentation and also because English was a good control group for no subjects. Uh, otherwise we only had, you know, I mean, should be a good uh, language to compare with French with respect. Um, outputs in contact with English and with con in contact with French. And then, so basically you had multiple languages in crossing, uh, meeting, in contact with other languages at the same time under the same social historical conditions, which helped us to factor out to a great extent um, everything that was determined by, by social linguistic factors, the attitude of the speaker, the level of education, we controlled for all these factors. We wanted people that left Italy without being fluent speakers of Italian. Maybe they went to school one year or two years, but these people were monolingual of these varieties. So that's how we selected them. And also these people moved um, after the war, many of them are still alive. So we could control for the input of the heritage speakers. And that was our intention, at least. Um, now, how did we find these people? Finding these people was extremely difficult. It proved extremely difficult because there is no archive or no register of, of these people. They left, many of them left Italy and they stayed there. They became citizens of these countries. And while the United States keeps tracks of the origin because of, of their culture, they have a lot of... Uh, um, reference to, to the ancestry, etc. Argentina and Brazil do not have that. So it was extremely hard. We thought, okay, what we do is we make a crowdsourcing atlas. Uh, we ask people to enter um, bits and pieces of recordings of free speech of their elderly uh, speakers. So say we, we, we targeted younger generations and we say why well, do you have a, a grandparent who is a speaker of one of these varieties record them please and put this online we ask them to speak about their their youth or the moment when they arrived to uh, argentina brazil canada and the united states uh, so that we could check for the past tense and we could check for transitivity differential object marking i'll tell you more later and, and we asked these people to do this. Now, I, um, we personally, we contacted every association, every possible place. There's a, this, the social linguistic situation of these uh, speakers is very different across countries. So we got a lot of response. I'll tell you in a minute how many from Italy, because Italy, this, this got a lot of attention from Italy but not from America. So we actually collected many of these uh, free speech also during our field work. The intention was, well, let's find the speakers that have the right profile, because then when we go on field work to collect the data, we know who to target. But this wasn't uh, very easy to do. In fact, we couldn't find these, uh, these speakers so easily. Um, and we actually just, uh, had to resort to pre-field work, for instance, or personal contact and, and just go there, ring it, ring the bell of associations, find this person through another person, uh, all sorts of things. So it was really extremely hard to find these speakers, harder than we expected. This is our team, um, people uh, that are here a little bit in uh, smaller, they, they have left um they left or uh, julian in particular he's uh, the person that helped us uh, design the atlas and realize the atlas at the moment these are the active people and the way we work is that each of us is responsible for an italo romance language or group of languages and for a country so for instance silvia is responsible for canada for field work in canada alberto is responsible for field work in brazil gigi well i was but then i couldn't anymore for personal reasons so gigi became responsible for field work in the united states and juana is responsible for field work in um, argentina field work which was which was realized actually by francesco and jan our pre previous uh, members of the project the first field work happened in uh, um, March, uh, May 2019, so last year. And the idea was we want to establish um, 
first, so the way we did it quickly was we first established kind of a shared language environment. Uh, we want these people to start speaking this language. So we asked them to tell us about when they arrived, for instance, in Sicilian. Then we give them a questionnaire, which we took quite a long time to realize, both because of bureaucratic uh, problems and because of, of data collection, data, um, data protection protocols, etc. but also like practicalities, how to interrogate these speakers. We, we have articles on this, if you're interested, and they're also in the, in the references, how to elicit data from uh, elderly people who speak a language you don't speak, and that was spoken 60 years ago in Italy, and it was spoken for 60 years in contact with uh, Brazilian Portuguese. That's not, not obvious. It is not your usual um, fieldwork. Uh, dialect field work, let's say. Uh, then we, we also checked for their knowledge when we could for their level of competence, uh, thanks to the HALA tests that were given to us from the Hawaii uh, language group. Um, and, and, and we tested in particular, uh, and we had the, the, some, some tasks. Uh, the, the one we used for um, most of the tests we did was were forced, forced choices. Do you want this? Do you want that? Which, which one do you prefer? Repetition tasks, repeat what I said. Uh, interactive tasks, um, like uh, uh, trying to elicit in the conversation uh, these things that happened, but also when it was about testing dialectics, taking uh, like a little peluche and putting them there and putting them here and say, where is it? It is this. Do you use this? Do you use that? Do you use this close to the addressee, etc.? And then complete the sentence. I didn't go yesterday to uh, eat because today I have eaten and stuff like that. It wasn't easy to collect everything. Now, this is a little bit of uh, Sicilian. Just to show you, we had to record the, the instructions and the data and, and, and the stimuli in each of these italo romance languages. Um, this is... Um... Ora vi facciamo ascoltare due frasi e andate a dire chi da che pare meglio tra i due. I hope that you heard this. Uh, this was the kind of stimulus they heard. Te sono nasce che va sasta idra. Te sono nasce che va sasta idra. And then you had to, to tell, to decide, uh, say, well, one or the other. They usually repeated it with or without differential object marking in this case. Um, or they said, yeah, the first one is fine. Of course, they were uh, scrambled. They were in random order. They were fillers. We did pay, paid attention to everything. For Daixis, there was a problem. The, the, that was the most problematic part. You will hear everything in, in uh, if you want, you can hear everything in Silvia Terengi's talk. Uh, this is a general paper where we discussed uh, all the methodology and what, how we, how we um, designed the, the questionnaire, etc. But you know, there are some languages, some little Romance languages, that have a special marker from uh, uh, close to the addressee. Uh, pronouns and, and demonstratives. You don't say this and that, but you say this, this close to the addressee, and that far from both. We wanted to know what happened to these in contact, and it was extremely hard to get people to understand the task. Because, of course, these people are illiterate, because they're very rather old, some of them. So it is very hard to get them to understand that they have to, that this person is speaking, etc. It is not obvious. So we had all sorts of strategies, but in the end, we did collect the data. With the COVID, of course, we were supposed to go to the second field work when, um, when uh, everything was blocked. So we had to resort to, to data collection at a distance. We did uh, manage to collect the data on differential object marking, uh, null subjects, but we did not manage, of course, to collect the data on dioxys and indexicals, because for that, it, you really need to be there in the room with the speaker. It is really impossible. In all, we collected uh, 50 total interviews set in Brazil, 74 in Argentina, 36 in Canada, 58 in the US, eight in Belgium. We also uh, included Belgium at some point because we saw that the Canada, the profile of Canadian speakers 
was so extremely different from everything else. Canadian speakers um, have a much, uh, on average, higher level of education, and they are um, what they, you would call experts, but also the emigrants, first generation emigrants, they're all bilingual. So there's always English interfering. We, we went to Canada for Quebec, for French. Uh, with the idea, okay, they left Italy long, long ago, they stayed there, they settled, they didn't have constant contact with Italy, they didn't attend Italian school. Well, this was not true for Canadians. But we found some communities in Belgium with this profile. We had just started collecting data in Belgium when COVID uh, started. So this is what I remember when I presented this uh, in Tromso when the project had just been awarded and this was about what I want to do and there were questions in the audience about how many speakers do you think do you want to because of course when you design an experiment you say okay I target 100 speakers I had target five speakers and I couldn't answer that and the reason why I couldn't answer that is that I wouldn't know I just couldn't predict how many people would uh, we would find in fact, we were rather lucky. We had a lot of helps from associations, but some associations are more active. Some languages have more people. Some, some languages have completely dis dispersed and they do not have clubs. They do not meet. The Italian Institute of Culture cannot track them out, down. So it is just, it was really a fishing expedition. It got a lot of results. So we got a lot of first generation speakers where we can see whether they their grammar is already, let's say, attrited at least or not. And so the input for the second generation, the problem is that um, very often we couldn't find full families. We did find people in the same community. So uh, somebody old and somebody young from the same community, but not many uh, parents, children, grandchildren. That was not very easy, unfortunately. But we got a lot. Uh, Italy wasn't part of the first inquiry. We just targeted Italy for some specific uh, sub projects. For the e field work, we found 29 respondents. Luckily, because we were expecting nobody to reply, but they actually did. 29 respondents from Brazil, 24 from Argentina, four from US, and eight from Belgium. We have 75 total. They are not always the same speakers that we interviewed in the first round. That was also because of COVID. We couldn't really make sure, we tried. Many of them are the same people. Some are not, but they come from the same places. Uh, we had an elicitation of some uh, questionnaires, some data from other uh, projects, some little projects. So an inquiry on differential object marking that got 389 uh, respondents in Italy and subject lytics in Veneto only got 788. For our crowdsourcing, we got, uh, the, these are the data that we have that you find uh, online. We, we got a lot from Italy, as you can see. Many of these, uh, so all of these Italians were crowdsourced, so Italians just uploaded their own data, but many of the Brazilian and Argentinian and um, US, etc., were collected during field work, so during the free speech, uh, free conversation. Right, so now what did we study? We studied um, no subjects in contact, differential object marking, diaxis and indexicality, and also the highest functional heads related to indexicality. The generalizations that we considered are, so the claim for null subjects is that they tend to get lost. So people tend to insert overt subjects when they, um, when they are in contact or they are speakers of L2, but also heritage speakers tend to insert overt subjects in null subject languages. Differential object marking weakens. It is not completely lost, but weakens. People just don't mark the object, the animate or definite object. Daixis um, is usually not affected by contact, so daixis stays the same. The pronominal system remains invariant, in doesn't vary because of contact. Uh, the demonstrative system varies a little bit, but it is much more stable. And the highest functional heads in lexicality, this is a generalization that is observed by Masha Polinsky, and she uh, tentatively assumes that uh, the highest functional heads in a functional projections are the ones that are indexical, like D and T in particular, so they should be the more resilient, like person, etc. 
So we tried to check whether these things are, are true. Um, these generalizations are mainly based on macro contact. Uh, again, contact between two languages that are typologically very different and for which the speakers can perceive the difference. Um, now, okay, this is not so important. What we found, we found that, well, if prodropping contact, you have two options. One is that you insert uh, extra overt pronouns where monolingual speakers wouldn't. And one is that you extend the prodrop to the language, if your language is, for instance, uh, non-prodrop. Well, they have both been um, documented. There, have been do there has been documentation both of omission uh, of not omission of pro drop, but that's not very insertion of an overt pro, um, pronoun, and that is an overt subject, and that is the most commonly uh, found strategy. There have been cases of documentation in which uh, the cases documented in which uh, pro drop was not affected at all, where pro drop was even extended in in uh, in in pro drop languages sometimes it passed over to the non pro drop language and there were cases in which the pro drop strategy was completely new like you start with a pro then you go on with the pro for all the discourse you start with an overt subject that's i think carvalho and child about um, um uruguay uh, spanish at the border etc so you uh, and you go on with the full subject so there there are also other strategies normally we consider this one, the prototypical, because it is more commonly found. And this one is like, okay, there are exceptions. There must be reasons for this. Well, what we want to say is that these are not exceptions. These are macro contact speakers that are choosing for the, op the cognitive option. Now, uh, the interface hypothesis, of course, uh, for no subjects requires or describes the reasons why uh, no subjects are more difficult to handle. And so speakers just uh, do not do not use them as often as monolingual speakers. Well, um, well, about no subjects, the same generalizations that we said before hold, avoid indeterminacy, and so avoid silent elements. And because uh, it is more difficult to understand what the referent is, just insert an overt subject. What we found? Well, um, in the literature, we already found some cases of micro contact of no subjects that resulted in non-affection of uh, no subjecthood. Um, the details of this is that uh, you can hear the whole talk by Alberto Frasson and Breche Vanos uh, in this, this workshop. But what we found is that null subjects tend to be preserved or even in contact between, in micro contact, extended to situations um, in which you didn't find null subjects in the, in the baseline. So this is uh, quite a different uh, output than what we expected. Um, one of the key features, this is what I would like to, to you to notice, is topicality. In other words, no subjects are created, are emerge in some contexts that where no subjects were not there or it, where they were there, but in a very different uh, way because grammar has been reshuffled around, uh, when they emerge, it is with topics, and in particular in context of topic continuation, which is not strange, but it is like topic is leading the field. So what this tells us is that, in fact, there is nothing wrong with computing topics. Speakers of micro-contact varieties, they can compute topics very easily. And most of the times what we see it is perhaps because they don't use topics to express no subjects, but they even resort to topics to express no subjects when the baseline doesn't have them. So topics are actually easy to compute. Um, macro contact of differential object marking, again, differential object marking is weakened. In, uh, in uh, we have many studies about this, uh, Spanish English, Russian English, and this is because of avoid ambiguities. I said the marker is the same, extra syntactic knowledge about topicality, animacy, definiteness, etc. What we found, well, we know that historically, for instance, there have been cases of uh, micro contact which resulted in a non-disappearance um, of differential object marking, but in its reinforcement. 
um, like Neapolitan in contact with Spanish, like standard Catalan in contact with, uh, with Spanish again. In particular, what we found, we found uh, in Heritage Veneton, Friulian, Abruzzese, and Sicilian, in contact with languages that do not have object marking, like Brazilian Portuguese, or um, languages that have extensive object marking, differential object, that much more than, than the, the, the rest of Romance, like Rio Platense, Spanish, etc. The generalization in all cases and in contact with all these languages, including Brazilian, Portuguese, and French and Italian, is that differential object marking remains stable or increases. The details and all the data and all the experiments, et cetera, you can hear them uh, in the talk by Luana Sorgini, again, in this, uh, in this conference. Again, differential object marking was created in some languages that do not have it in the baseline or yeah, that are not, yeah, that do not have it in the, in the deadline, in their baseline, sorry. And this, they happened in context of topicality. So topics, again, are this, the point where the change starts. But it is not that they change, it is, well, I mean, this is no news, but topics are not impossible to compute. In fact, they are used to start new phenomena, phenomena that didn't exist, to import. They get imported from uh, from the topics um, and this is uh, again non, not surprising but uh, this is what we we observed again notice that italian also has uh, cases like standard italian of differential object marking in topicalization when you when you have the famous a me uh, me interessa etc this 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 kind of uh, phenomena are not new but they are not attested in heritage languages. Um, another thing that I didn't tell you, and I forgot to mention this for, for no subjects, but I want to mention this in differential object marking, is that Creoles that have no subjects and, if, and uh, Creoles that have differential object, object marking, those that have it, they built it based on topics topic continuation in the case of no subjects and to mark topics in the case of differential object marking. So this relying on a topic, relying on what I want to tell you, linking to resolve your, your language contact situation is something which is found also in Creoles. Okay. Um, Deixis. So for deixis, we expected pronouns not to change and also demonstratives not to change so much. And what we found is that, in fact, they don't. They are completely stable. Indexicals are indexicals of the sort like a referential pronoun, personal pronouns, but also demonstratives. They do not change. And if they evolve, for instance, demonstratives, three-way system, three systems for demonstratives, evolve sometimes, they evolve along the same lines of the di diachronic evolution. We know that these varieties uh, were selected, I forgot to mention that, but these varieties were, were selected, the Italo-Romans, also based on the fact that they have a long history. So they, were, they, are, they, are, they are traditionally, um, they can be tracked down. You can, you can follow the development of all these parts because they are documented, they were written, they had a standard in some times. So they were also official languages at some point, which means that uh, you can check. And so the only development we see is the development of the kind that we see in these um, in diachrony. The details of the rearrangement of all systems and all shifts and creoles in dexicals, you can hear them in the talk by Silvia Terenghi here in the HLS. Um, so indexicals are, are, are not heavily affected by contact. Um, and this is uh, in agreement to what Polinsky also observed. Uh, last, quickly, what we found uh, about determiner uh, tense and C drop. Well, in New York City, so now in a macro contact situation, we didn't actually expect these, uh, in particular D and T to be affected so much, but we found a lot of empty determiners 
um, not just for when English has bare plurals. We found empty determiners um, or the overexpression of determiners with, with possessives. Uh, and we found a lot of T drop, a lot of auxiliary drop, which is, which is attested. People, people know this, this has been recorded. But so these, these um, in macro contact, we would expect T and C and D, uh, not, not so much C, but D and T at least to be a bit more resilient. But in fact, this is not what we found. And the complementizers, we found a lot of empty uh, relative clauses, uh, complementizers, but also clausal complementizers. So, uh, clausal complementizers, that, etc. The details of these data are in the talk by uh, Luigi Gigi Andriani. To sum up, what we found is that macro contact is a weak, in, in snow subjects are weakened or rarely stay unaffected in macro contact, that's in the literature. What we found is the opposite. They, they actually uh, stay unaffected or are even strengthened. You see more no subjects than you would expect. And in extreme macro contact, which is what we called creoles, they behave more or less, if you have them, like a micro contact. For differential object marking, the same. It is weakened in macro contact, but strengthened or not affected in micro contact and in extreme macro contact, diexis is unaffected and it stays unaffected. So uh, the odd one out here is actually macro contact. It is the contact as we considered it now. So heritage studies one-to-one, -one, this is the odd one out. So all the generalizations that have been made, all the uh, interface hypotheses, all these general rules, they hold, of course they hold, but they hold for macro contact, for two languages that are clearly distinct, for which the speaker can perceive uh, typological distance or proximity. So in this sense, what uh, Jason Rothman says uh, about the typological supremacy novel, uh, model is perfectly applying to macro contact. Problem is that the rest of contact situations, at least what we looked, we didn't look at L2 learners like this. I mean, we, these are just, um, let's say, uh, spontaneous uh, situations in, uh, of uh, language contact. These are different. So, uh, and also what we found is topicality and indexicality are keys to change or not, I mean, indexicality and topicality are there. They are there now, indexicality doesn't seem to be affected. And that's probably because uh, computing an indexical is much easier. So you have your referent in your, around you. So you do, not you do not need a lot of computation. Topics are a different thing, but topics are there. They are present, they are what leads and drives change. So basically the idea, what, what we see is that, um, Again, the conclusions, if speakers are able to perceive the point of variation, they will follow all the strategies that we know from the literature, but when they are not, they resort to some general cognitive uh, principles, probably linking. They, they, they first link to, to the environment via indexicals, they exist, they exist, or they link to discourse, to what has been said before. Of course, linking, to discourse is then more difficult because that involves a lot more processing, et cetera, more computation, let's say. And that is why you see, when you see purely, when you look at pure topicality in itself, it seems that it changes a lot. It changes a lot because it's difficult, but it is there as a basic cognitive structure. So uh, we have identified these two uh, this is my conclusion. Uh, more detail of the data and etc. is in the rest of the um, the project and in other talks. Um, thank you very much for your attention. In fact, I uh, I can stop right now. But I need to share. Sorry, I forgot to share, but I am forced to share. <laughs> not forced, but it is good if I share acknowledgements of the ERC. Thank you very much and uh, bye.